The future state of any system is in part dependent on that system's initial conditions. So what do these initial conditions look like in the humanitarian system at present? Take Typhoon Yolanda. How might Ocha's response to this devastating typhoon be a sign of things to come? I collaborated directly with Ocha during this response and just returned from the Philippines. So here's my report on the current state of humanitarian response. First, Ocha activated the Digital Humanitarian Network. The DHN serves as the official interface for formal humanitarian organizations to solicit support from tech-savvy digital volunteers. At Ocha's request, for example, volunteers from the Humanitarian Open Street Map traced high-resolution satellite imagery to create the most detailed street maps of the disaster-affected areas. Meanwhile, volunteers with a standby task force crowdsourced a tagging of more than 5,000 images posted on Twitter. For quality control purposes, these images were shown to three different volunteers at a time, and only if three volunteers agreed that an image showed mild or severe damage did that picture get added to this live crisis map, which was developed by GIS Corps and ESRI to provide OCHA with greater situational awareness in the immediate aftermath of the typhoon. GIS Corps also created this map of cell phone coverage thanks to data that OCHA received from GSMA. In addition, the Standby Task Force rapidly crowdsourced a collection of 3Ws data to augment OCHA's information products, which Valerie Amos is studying in this picture. OCHA also produced their standard hard copy information products. These were in very high demand in the Philippines. And information graphics like these were also made available by OCHA and very popular with headquarters. But I was stunned by how manual and time-consuming OCHA's information management processes are. OCHA's information management officers, IMOs, spend hours every day manually copying and pasting rows and columns from dozens of Excel spreadsheets provided by different clusters in different formats. This process is particularly error-prone and definitely leads to blurry eyes. In addition, cluster IMOs are beginning to face a major new challenge. Their data sets are so large that they can't be handled inside Excel. Welcome to the age of big data, of big crisis data. Amidst these struggles, however, new solutions emerge, such as this IM Skype chat connecting all information management officers across the Philippines. I was amazed by how rapidly information was being shared in the Skype chat and how this accelerated collaboration and coordination. The novel use of Dropbox to quickly upload and download datasets was also a very smart move by OCHA's IM team in Manila. OSHA also curated external information, taking on the role of information DJ, if you will. The Philippines has many tech-savvy digital groups, a number of which created their own information products and collected their own information. So OSHA leveraged these new data sources, filtering for relevant data and adding said data to their own information products. Now, the lack of internet access in the hardest hit areas created a major challenge for OSHA and cluster agencies. For example, scheduling cluster meetings in Ormoc proved a major, major challenge. So OCHA is launching its own web-based check-in service as part of the Humanitarian Response Platform. Humanitarians sign up to this service while in Manila before deploying to the field. This allows OCHA to send out text messages to all those who registered, providing them with important updates on both meetings and other relevant operational information. UAVs also played an important role in documenting shelter damage and supporting road clearance operations, as well as helping to search for survivors amidst the debris. It's worth noting that OCHA's IMOs in the field are working from these hardest hit areas. So the disconnect that often exists between headquarters and the field was also apparent in this situation. On the right here, you see an OCHA uh, setup in uh, Guyan in the Philippines. The conditions under which they work is uh, obviously very different from those that we work in at uh, headquarters. 
So I was particularly stunned uh, when I realized that IMOs in the field were spending about 50% of their time uh, feeding information back to headquarters, developing information products that ultimately had little relevance to the operational response on the ground. In addition, the information requests coming from headquarters were also somewhat incredible. For example, identifying the total uh, affected population that is in need. Frankly, it's impossible to come up with such a number, or, or an accurate number. And so information management officers are really forced to make guesstimates using arbitrary weights just to come up with magic numbers for headquarters and the SRP. Honestly, headquarters might as well be asking IMOs to pull a rabbit out of a hat. So given these initial conditions as witnessed at the close of 2013, what's in store for 2025? Well, the world would have become fully digitized and electrified with uninterrupted real-time communications even after major disasters. There will be no such thing as big data any longer. Our analytical tools will be able to handle large volumes and velocities of information. And the United Nations in New York will look like this. By the end of 2025, OCHA will release its data and trends for that year. Including in this will be this particular chart. The red dot shows where we were in 2013. The new dot shows where we are now, just 11 years later. And by this way, this is not made up data. This is taken from the ITU as projected data on estimated mobile phone subscribers past 2020. Our platforms will become a lot more sophisticated for information management, allowing us to do real-time, truly real-time situational awareness during disasters. Augmented reality apps and Google Glass type technology will allow OSHA to have a check-in system that is much more sophisticated and able to do a lot more than check-ins. In 2025, OSHA's information management offices can actually provide HQ with the total affected number of individuals, provide this number in real time. And this will be thanks to mobile technology, sensors, and so on that will be able to automatically identify displaced numbers, needs, and so on. Meanwhile, the digital humanitarian network is now powered by artificial intelligence, enabling digital volunteers to process and analyze in real time billions of eyewitness reports, images, and videos posted on social media. Most importantly, local communities are now tech-enabled first responders, mobilizing faster, better, and longer than external relief agencies. This rise in tech-enabled self-help and mutual aid takes pressure off the international humanitarian community. Now, This picture of 2025 is all nice and well, but how do we get there from here? How do we create the right initial conditions? Well, this is not going to happen automatically. We need enlightened leadership and policy making. Perhaps the single biggest problem that I have seen, that policymakers, those who decide on budgets, are still completely blind to the critical importance of data. Now, humanitarian organizations do not need to become data science organizations, but they do need to have access so that their data can be used by partners like the Digital Humanitarian Network to augment situational awareness for responders. Without greater investment and a greater realization in the importance of data, then getting accurate numbers in a timely manner will continue to be like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. So if policymakers continue to ignore the importance of data access, then information management in 2025 will look exactly like it does today. And UN OCHA will shrink in importance and relevance, being relegated to the basement of this building. To avoid this, a premium on data must be acted on, and OCHA should continue to look at developing platforms that facilitate self-organization and creating interfaces between crowdsourcing and digital volunteers, as well as formal humanitarian organizations. Moreover, OCHA should be taking the lead in enabling crowdfunding during disasters. 
As a British author once said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. I agree with this. The future of digital humanitarian response is here. OCHA is already behind the Digital Humanitarian Network, and their IM team represents some of the most forward-thinking humanitarians as far as information management goes. So to policymakers, you need to empower your information management officers. Let them take risks. Let them think outside the box and consider unorthodox solutions. At the same time, we must be also very careful that our enthusiasm for new technology does not overtake ethical and humanitarian accountability principles around informed consent, data privacy, and do no harm. This, I believe, will be the greatest struggle we will face over the next decade, trying our damned hardest not to build the Jurassic Park of big data.